Is there a sense of, um, I, I think you've written about this for sure, um, and I've heard this in other places, a kind of nostalgia for the Soviet era. And is that nostalgia founded in, I mean, because nostalgia kind of has this quality of not being based in what was actually happening or what it was actually like. It's just a, a longing for something different or some idea of the past. But I imagine, and as you've pointed to with your research, that there was like actual things that they probably deeply do miss <laughs> a certain stability or a certain type of uh, uh, quality of life that uh, just could not exist currently. Um, yeah. So what is it, I guess the general sense that people have now, um, from your research as far as, far as like what their attitude was about that time, mm -hmm. uh, in Soviet era. Yeah. So there's a great joke, um, that is told in many countries in, in this part of the world. And, uh, I'll tell you, cause it, it sort of encapsulates the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So there's a woman wakes up in the middle of the night, she's panicking and she's had a terrible nightmare and she, runs into the bathroom and opens the medicine cabinet and closes the door. And then she runs into the kitchen and opens the refrigerator and then closes the door. And then she runs out into the living room, opens the window, looks out onto the street, closes the window, lets out a deep sigh and goes back to bed. And her husband goes, what was that about? And she says, I had this terrible nightmare. I dreamed that our medicine cabinet was filled with the medicines that we need, that our refrigerator was filled with food, and that the streets were absolutely clean and orderly. And he goes, how is that a nightmare? And she says, oh, I thought the communists were back in power. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, it's meant to be a kind of ironic joke, obviously. Sure. And yeah. you know, there are really bad things about a lot of these communist countries as they existed in the 20th century. I don't want to sugarcoat that, right? There were travel restrictions and consumer shortages. There was the secret police. You know, if we go back to the 30s and we look at the Stalinist era, you have the purges and the famines and the gulags. And these are, you know, I don't want to deny that those things are real. But there are a lot of things that we don't hear about as Americans, like ordinary things about people's lives that made their lives much more stable and by far less commodified than our contemporary lives today. And so when people are nostalgic for the past, you know, some of some of the nostalgia, you know, comes very concretely from what are often called the losers of the transition. So people whose socioeconomic status has really declined since 1989 or 91, and they're genuinely nostalgic for a better standard of living that they had in the past. These generally tend to be older people, not surprisingly. But where I think the sort of youth, and there is a youth nostalgia, so even people who were born in the 80s or born after the collapse of state socialism in Eastern Europe are nostalgic for that past, nostalgic mm -hmm. for that past, which is odd, right? Because they didn't really live it. But there's a very pervasive sense, uh, and my colleague Maria Todorova in Bulgaria has written about this extensively, that there was a kind of unique sociality to growing up in a non-market or relatively non-market economy where everybody had a job guarantee. You had basic food, basic needs taken care of. You had usually a house. You were often crowded into a house, but you had a roof over your head. You had food. You didn't have very much choice but you had basic caloric intake covered. Yeah. You had clothes. They were pretty ugly, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but they kept you warm, right? right. Um, I think like uh, Kate Sorper's book, Alternative Hedonism here is a really interesting frame with which to look at some of these realities of, of state socialism in Eastern Europe. You had public transportation, not private cars. You had good education, um, but not everybody could go to university and get the degrees that they wanted because there was like central planning around different professions. So there were like things that allowed you to maintain a certain standard of living. There was a floor under which you could not fall. And then there were pretty high, uh, you know, pretty strict limits above which you could not rise. Right. So inequality in these societies was very low. There were differences, but there was, but it was very minor compared to what came afterwards, right? Right. Um, and you know, there are just some absolute unequivocal facts of the matter, right? When when Russia in 1910, the average life expectancy of a Russian was 33 years old. At the same year in France, of course, this is before First World War, 
it was 49. That's a 16 year gap in life expectancy between Russia and France. Wow. By the time you get to 1970, the average life expectancy in France is 71. And in Russia, it's in the Soviet Union, the communist Soviet Union, it's 68. So the gap has been reduced to only three years. And that's despite all of the problems of the Soviet economy, right? So when we look at things like life expectancy, when we look at things like population health, when we look at things like women's rights, right? We can actually see, and again, I'm not, these aren't, these aren't just figures I'm making up. Anybody can go online and find this data. It's available for anybody to see. You have to recognize that there were some things these countries did right. Not everything. And I don't think we should bring them back because they had lots of problems associated with them. But as part of the political and ideological toolkit that we need to have in order to face the many challenges of the 21st century. These are problems like climate change and the pandemic and inequality and automation that the market cannot solve. Rather than reinventing the wheel, which is what the left always seems to want to do, we should go back I think, and learn from the experience of the past. And what better place to to learn from than these countries, which actually presented a real alternative to the capitalism, you know, the capitalist model of development that we have today in the 20th century. I just think it's really important to go back and look at the things that they might have done right. And yes, when you talk about housing as a human right, or you talk about healthcare, or you talk about um, you know the Green New Deal or jobs guarantees, or all of these very practical policies that we could put into place to make people's lives more manageable and ultimately more free, right? Um, people are going to call you a socialist. They're going to call you a communist. They're going to try to shut you down because there are those are ideas that were often implemented in this part of the world. There's some history history there, mm-hmm. historical um, truth to the fact that yeah, job guarantees you know had their ups and downs in the way that they were implemented in Eastern Europe under central planning. That doesn't mean we can't rethink those things, but it does mean we have to rather than run away from the state socialist past, we should try to like interrogate that past in a more nuanced and thoughtful way rather than just sort of, you know, relegating it all to the dustbin of some sort of Stalinist totalitarian nightmare, which is how it often gets described in contemporary American political discourse. Yes. And I really want to, I want to hone in on the anti-communist ideology. Um, But I do want to ask before we get to that, just to talk a bit about again, like what life was like under these socialist states. Um, You know, we're talking about basic human needs, uh, shelter, access to health care, food, water, all of these things. And this is all, uh, you know, these are basic material needs, but, you know, interpersonal relationships, how this impacts our ability to have meaningful uh, relationships with one another, whether that's through friendships, family, uh, lovers, so on. Um, it seems like that all has a huge impact. I mean, all of us know what it's like to be to, to grow up in maybe a household that you were strapped for cash or, you know, the parents were working, each working 40 plus hours a week. I mean, like capitalism imposes a certain thing on us and we're all raised under those conditions and it, it informs almost every aspect of our lives there, thereafter. So it's like, of course, this has a huge impact on our development, our personalities, um, our traumas and so on. So I'm curious about how living under maybe a state socialist system um, would affect, um, say, like women's autonomy, their ability to choose who they want to be with, um, or men, uh, or those that do not fit in that binary, um, you know, how their their ability to just operate Mm -hmm. within their relationships. I mean, what were some of the uh, trends that you observed in your work and also just by speaking to people. I know that again, that probably a bit, a lot of that nostalgia harkens back to that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The sociality thing. I mean, and I find this in the weirdest places. So even like um, a country like Romania, which had a really terrible dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu was really oppressive. And yet people are also really nostalgic 
for the era because of the way people treated each other differently. And I also think just, you know, to make a note here, we can also see some of this at, you know, operating in like the more Scandinavian sort of Mm -hmm. democratic socialist countries. It's not just the East, but essentially what happens, I mean, as you pointed out, a lot of us are working really hard. A lot of us are hustling. Um, Young kids, young people today feel like they have to constantly be branding themselves, investing in their human capital. Um, They themselves have become sort of neoliberal products, right? Um, Malcolm Harris has a great book called Kids These Days, where he talks about the making of millennials. Wendy Brown, a political theorist, wrote this wonderful book called Undoing the Demos, which is how neoliberalism has infected the polity. But the key thing that I think we struggle with in late capitalism in the United States is the commodification of the self, the commodification of our emotions, our affections, our attentions, like our even our individualism, right? It, everything is being mediated by an app on a phone or mm-hmm. by, by some screen or some corporation that's trying to find a way to monetize things that we need, like basic human emotions that we want to express um, or have expressed to us. And that's the power of capital, right? And you go back to the Communist Manifesto and you can read about how capital just sort of sinks into every aspect of our lives to find ways to extract profit from us. And I think what happens is when you have a society with wider social safety nets, and again, this is for both men and women and people who don't fit into that binary, Anybody who lives in a society who knows that they're going to have health care if they need it, that they're going to have food to eat and a roof over their head and heat in the winter, which is really important in this part of the world and very important in Texas, apparently, these days. Yeah, yeah apparently. Um, you, are, you have far fewer incentives to commodify every interaction that you have with another human being. One of the things that people in this part of the world who grew up under both systems, so I was 19 when the the Berlin Wall fell, and most of my colleagues and peers were the same age. So they lived like the first 20 years of their lives under communism and then 30 years under capitalism. And some of my um, colleagues who are older have like 30 years under the socialist system, and then they were 30, like your age, when it changed, right? Right. And, And suddenly they're thrown into capitalism when, it, you know, in their, in their mid thirties and now they're in their mid sixties, they're getting close to retirement age. And one of the things they all say, what they all miss is this idea that human relationships existed independent of the market, right? Mm-hmm. You went to the store to buy things like food and clothes and cigarettes and booze or whatever, right? But you never treated your relationships necessarily like a commodity. You never sold your attentions. You never sold your affections. You never even felt like compelled to transactionalize your human contact with another person, whether that's a lover or a friend or a family member or a colleague or a comrade, right? And what, what the introduction of capitalism has done is to make everybody feel like a commodity. And to make our time, you know, obviously capitalism extracts labor power from us, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Through uh, the extraction of surplus labor from our our work. But what's happened, I think, with late capitalism is increasingly it's extracting value from our attention and our emotions. And that is really something that I think deteriorates the quality of human relationships for everyone. And people who have experience of one system or the other, you know, who, who've straddled this divide, they can really pinpoint what it is about late capitalism that is so dehumanizing. I mean, obviously, Marxists have been talking about alienation for a long time, but it's usually alienation from one's labor, not alienation from oneself, right? Mm. And one's and one's loved ones. And so I think, you know, this really shows up in the way that we talk about relationships in the West, we say that we invest in a relationship or we invest in a friendship. Like yeah. what kind of concept is that, right? We're, we're assuming that this other human being, you know, we're sort of buying shares in them, so to speak, that will pay off at some future date. 
what a weird way to interact with our fellow human beings, you know, or, or um, we spend time rather than sharing time with people. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of interesting, you know, we do the work around a relationship or when we um, end up, you know, leave one relationship and we uh, decide to go out and look for another partner, we talk about being back on the market, <laughs> right? Oh my God. Even the way that we talk about relationships in, in our late capitalist society, it's so commodified. And yeah. I know it's hard to come up with other terms and words when these are so pervasive and popular, but I think we should really think, you know, profoundly about why it is that we live in a society where everybody is constantly hustling and the hustle, this fear of falling, this fear of not being able to ca ca keep up and catch up is, is poisoning um, not just our environment, which is extremely important, but also our relationships, which I think for a lot of people, you know, are, are, are the kind of front line of our emotions are these people in our lives who are around us. Thank you.